Welcome back for the afternoon. Uh, I'm Graham, but I get to introduce our next guest, who is Jennifer Knapp, a Grammy-nominated musician and the author of a recent book, who is an uncompromising advocate for LGBTQI folks. Uh, and so we're very grateful that she's here. Um, and uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uncompromising, huh? Right. It's, I compromise all the time. I'm a married woman, practically. Just not this afternoon. Uh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> so I thought I'd, I don't really have like a hard and set plan. Mostly today I wanted to encourage you to be as conversational with me throughout uh, this time as possible. I mean, I've got my bullet points and a couple things I'd like to get through, but if at some point in time something really intrigues you or interests you in, in some regard, don't hesitate to try and get my attention as politely as possible, and I'd love to have more of a chat, really, than a lecture or anything boring like that, because that's boring. But I'm going to start by uh, dominating the stage and reading an excerpt from my autobiography. Um, um, and it, and uh, I want to set it up by, by saying, I think one of the first things that happens, in particular, for LGBT people inside a faith community is this moment in time where you figure out what you're going to let go of and what you're going to keep. Um, it's an issue of friends, it's an issue of, of process of faith, of the people and friends around you. And so, and as a musician, and in particular in my art, um, that was one of the things that I came to experience as well. Like, what was I going to keep? Um, and I didn't realize it at this time, but this is a story about how art was actually showing its way and what I would keep and, and not keep. Um, oh, and the setup is that I, I've actually quit Christian music. I'm getting ready to sell all my junk, and I'm moving the country. Uh, after making my way through countless cities, countries, and cultures, I'd yet to find the new home I longed for. I wanted to make a definitive move to get as far as geographically, get as far away as geographically possible, officially severing ties with Music City, USA. This time, we downsized what we owned, packed what remained into a shipping container, and made our voyage to my partner's native country, Australia. Now, if you're searching for a truly cathartic experience in your life, try purging your life of the material possessions that encumber you. In preparing for our relocation down under, we were limited to the given cubic space of a small shipping container. For me, it proved to be just what the doctor ordered. In the throes of my pagan rituals, I set about offloading every last reminder of my musical life by selling all I could do, selling all I could on eBay. Had it not been for my partner, I probably would have burned my gold record plaque and chucked my Dove Awards into the Cumberland. Upon her insistence, I left it to Karen to seal them away in boxes and keep them out of my sight. Just looking at them was enough to send me into a spiral of depression. My life in Nashville was over. I was unsentimentally relentless. As much as possible, as much as possible needed to go. Along with the sofas, cars, and office equipment, I purposed to jettison every guitar I owned, all my recording equipment, and even the trumpet that had so faithfully served as my gateway drug into music. One by one, I polished, photographed, and priced my darling little children, putting them to the auction blocks, in hopes of never being reminded of them and the life that they offered again. Karen was aghast. Surely you don't want to do this, she said, confounded. Maybe you aren't going to do Christian music anymore, but this is extreme. You've played music your whole life. Giving up on one doesn't mean you have to throw the babies out with the bathwater. I didn't care. As long as these pieces were around, I felt taunted by the life I had lost. Even going through them now was a pain almost too debilitating to bear. These are just things, I insisted. They don't mean anything special. I did my best to downplay the significance of the bloodletting. Hun, you'll play again. It's, it's part of you. She gently grabbed my arm, looked into my eyes, pleading for me not to go through with it. I just don't want you to do something you will regret later. Trust me, I won't, I reassured her. I'm ready to wash my hands of the whole thing. I was fully convinced that whatever pangs of remorse that were moving through me were those of guilt over the life 
that I was denying God any access to. I didn't want to play CCM anymore, and in doing so, reckoned I was in no way honoring God. The logic played itself out in my head and in my twisted mind. No Christian music, no God. You don't, dis you don't serve God, so there is no point to playing music. To top it off, you're gay, and that definitely means you've fallen. The thoughts echoed through me, muddled and yet certain. Every time I opened the door to even considering the deep sorrow of how I had come to this place, I was greeted by all the voices of Christian descent that had written themselves into my psyche. They went on to say, you are not worthy of singing. If you dare sing again, God will smite you. By not using your voice for God, you are ruining the good works for which you were purposed. God will not bless the life of a depraved homosexual. You might sing again, but no good will come of it. God will never allow you to sing again. I lack the courage and the confidence to test their certainty. Now, getting rid of all that stuff was the only solution. This chapter of my life had surely ended, so carrying it across the globe wasn't a necessity anymore. Avoid, purge, destroy. Karen had had enough of my shenanigans. I won't let you do it. She stood between me and the instruments like a protector against my evil deeds. You will play again. I can't help but believe it. Let's pack the most valuable guitars, take them to Australia with us. Give time a chance. Later on, if you still, still feel this strongly, you can sell them there. She appealed to my appreciation of value. You'll get more money for them in Oz if you decide to tell, sell them there anyway. With that, she took possession of what I seemed to so easily discard. She took the guitars, piled them into the corner of all that we aimed to take with us. If it seemed I had given up, she had not. I always choke up at this bit. They are a part of you, and they're coming with us. And that was that. Safely tucked away in their armored cases, they rested, gathering dust, awaiting the day that Karen's vision might come true. Sorry. <laughs> Such an artist. Um, yeah, I, I haven't practiced reading that story in public, and that's a little bit why. Um, I think that's the, the part of me that is by far the biggest um, vein running through what I get to do today and why I participate at all in talking about sexual orientation in public, let alone in such a volatile place as faith community where so much is said that's so deeply and emotionally hurtful. Yet, as an artist, you know, that's what I do. That's my business. That's my ulterior motive. It's to play a song that makes you, well, first, I do have ulterior motives. I, I want you to like me. <laughs> I want you to think I'm a rock star and that I'm awesome. I want to sell lots of records and win Grammys. But I also play with another ulterior motive, and that's to connect emotionally. You know, as, a, as any art, artist, we, we, we tap into nostalgia, into romance, into the power of a moment, personal empowerment, to be able to find the songs that are the anthems of our lives. That's one of the ulterior motives. But also in art, we tend to have social and political ulterior motives as well. The experiences that we have while we're living that life of nostalgia and romance, spirituality, start to come out in ways that we see and imagine shaping our world. And I'm no different. And in particular, in my time with Christian music, that definitely has an ulterior motive and a very particular agenda to talk about faith and in that experience. Um, and now my ulterior motive, you know, anytime I get up on stage is to, to try and still make the world a better place, hopefully for all of us to love one another and connect in that commonality and sexual orientation to become part of that conversation. But in, in talking about, like, the ulterior motives that, we, that I have in the way that I approach my music, at the end of the day, I want to use it. I want, it to, I want to see it do things, not just serve me and be a rock star. That's not working out at all. But I want to see it change the world around me. That's when 
I think for me, music or any kind of art that starts in a solitary place for an artist, you know, it starts with our own personal experience and the things that we feel like we've got to get out and make and shape, but it becomes its own thing and its own language once it joins community and it goes out into the world and connects with other people. That's when art becomes, I think, its, its true self. It, you know, you may be the master of it in a moment, but it becomes actually something that we share in community. Um, so with all that being said, the thing I think about is what role I want to take in that great responsibility, actually. Um, what message, if, if, if that is the end result of where art is going to take me, what do I do with that then? What message do I share? And knowing that there's, there's going to be a social and kind of a political ex experience to happen with the music. But before I get to that space, I just kind of want to show that, that personal example. Um, of that private space where when I be actually picked up my guitars that I didn't throw into the ocean, that I didn't sell, I did keep it and about seven to ten, seven or eight years later I just picked it up one day and, and started playing again and in that came uh, this particular song is one of the first ones that I remember writing and just going, oh crap, I'm gonna have to play that in front of people someday and I don't know what the, the what the, you know, I don't know what the future of this is, but I'm kind of scared of it. Even though they say we have fallen Doesn't mean that I won't do it twice Given every second chance I choose again to be with you tonight Sorry is often told but hardly ever done Not with you my love Not with you All the ancient stories that hold a bitter end Not with you, my friend Not with you, my friend I lift you up like a loving cup Pour down on all the world And if this fable's strong enough We'll drink more than our fear even though they say we have fallen Doesn't mean that I won't do it twice Given every second chance I choose again To be with you tonight So the wind blows cold, I say it's crisp and clear All for you, my dear All for you, my dear And though the clouds roll by, I say that hidden in the sky is a blazing sun Wait, here it comes, I lift you up like a loving cup Pour down on all the world And if this fable's strong enough We'll drink more than our fear Even though they say we have fallen Doesn't mean that I won't do it twice Forgiven ever Second chance I choose again to be with you tonight If all that's left behind Are the pieces I they find of the two of us Born from the wild, wild lust They'll lift us up like a loving cup 
pour down on all the world. And if this fable's strong enough, we'll drink more than our fill. Even though they say we have fallen. Oh, given every second chance I choose again to be with you tonight. Oh, oh, oh given every second chance I choose again to be with you Um, yeah, I remember the first time I played that song, and I was totally freaked out because I thought everyone was going to totally know that it was a Leslie song, and that you know, and I hadn't done. It. Does it sound like a Leslie song to you? Well, a little bit. Uh, yeah, but I shouldn't judge. <laughs> Leslie's can spot it a mile away. That's a, that's a litmus test to figure out who's a lesbian in the room. You play that song, and then all of a sudden the girls start looking at each other. <laughs> Dude, and, and then the gay boys too. I love you too. Um, straight guys get uncomfortable. Get really straight. Um, but you know, the the fascinating thing to me is that in coming out, one of the things that in my own personal coming out is that it actually affected my art. And I don't know why I didn't think that it would. Um, I I, I kind of hope that it wouldn't. I guess in some space because I don't want to be normal or something, but it, it did. It started showing up in my music, and when I started being willing to, to talk to other people about who I was and just be myself and normal in society and every other day, it actually showed up in my music. It showed up in the things, like all things that are important to us that we're willing to share, like sprinkled in everything that we do and we say in some way or another. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be this overriding agenda or headline, although some of us try to make the experiences of our life a headline when we walk into a room. But for me, I, I, in my own personality, I'm a lot more subtle than that, actually. I'm really quiet, and I'm really private in real life, and I like to give you a hint of something without beating you over the head, of, head with it. I want you to know, I want to give people an invitation into my experience, but I don't want to tell people that they have to have the experience that I've had. And I, had, I, I started to notice this as a, you know, in, in terms of my art, as a pattern in my art, I was thinking that, oh, I was smart and doing something, it was just actually, actually just reflecting my personality. It wasn't that I sat down and said, oh, this is the way that I'm going to approach it and this is how you do it. It just it was this great and fancy accident. But the beauty of that is that it, it does reflect my personality and, and one of the things that I've noticed is a thing that has not only reflected in the music that I'm doing, but it's also taught me about how to participate in a community with other people. It's taught me to be I don't want to say, uh, uh, what I want to say is that one of the things that I find inside of faith community and being out and talking about what for some places is a very contentious, very hard and emotional subject to talk about is that one of the first things that needs to happen is the temperature needs to go down in the room. There's all this, you know, energy of opposition and opposing arguments Everybody wants to be heard. And I find that as an artist, one of the first things that happens when I've gone into a sanctuary to talk about my experience, to put on my guitar, to play a song, to play, play something that you emotionally connect to as a, another shared individual, it, it actually neutralizes opposition. It, it's one of the ways I like to describe it is that whatever road or whatever line or lyric or moment of that song that brought you and got your attention and brings you in, and you listen to it and you actively take it, my song, anybody else's song, or any piece of art, we follow that road to it. Because almost like in a trance of our own experience, right? Our own feeling and our own connection with it. And then all of a sudden, after you maybe are done with your own personal experience with that, you look up and you see who else is around you. And it's kind of like spokes in a wheel, right? Where everybody's kind of traveled from one road to the next. 
um, to arrive at the central place of shared understanding and a place of common good. And so what I think about is what can I do now as a writer? I think about that all the time. What can I do in my writing in the way that I, I share my music with other people to give you the widest possible door to walk through to be able to come with me? In all of my ulterior motives, yes. I want to get the I want you know, I want white girls and black, you know, black people and Chinese people and old people. I want every demographic that you can name to buy one of my records. I want that. So I want to be able to connect with you. And the only way that I personally know how to do that is to find something that we all understand. We all understand love. We understand what it's like to be rejected. For me, it's, it's choosing a position of trying to find a neutral space. So it's neutralizing the opposition. Um, I'm talking a lot more than I actually intended to, to actually yammer on today, but I'm actually really extremely passionate about it because I think there's a lot of purpose that goes in to any of the ulterior motives that we have to not think that in doing so that you get to tell and give somebody, you know, tell somebody what they should do or what they should think or what they should believe. I'm very passionate about giving, like I said, giving somebody the pathway into that. Um, I, th I think actually there's an excerpt from the book um, that actually is, is pretty good for me. That, you know, oftentimes when, when I'm in a space of talking about sexual orientation in public community, especially in, in Christian worlds where it's largely dialogue and lots of talking, that the concept is that, that I'm here to change your mind, or that I'm here to get you to do something that you don't want to do. And the only thing I actually want, particularly because of my heart as an artist, is all I want you to do is connect. All I want you to do is look up for a second at what road has taken you to the space that you're in and, you know, see who else is around you. So there's this odd little experience I had after moving to Australia. I decided to get off the grid. I totally went walkabout. Anyone ever heard that phrase? went to the bush, and no, that means something totally different in Australia than it does here. <laughs> I was in the bush. And, uh, yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time just kind of literally out in the wilderness. So this is a little bit of that excerpt, excerpt from that. We made our camp many a night with no other living soul around but each other. The height of extravagance would come on the days one of us would manage to catch a recognizable fish from the ocean. For every barren stretch that seemed to make Australia such a de desolate and hostile place, we always managed to find an oasis that made the hardships all the more nobly won. There were times when I questioned the wisdom of two petite lesbians going it alone so far removed from civilization. Beyond coping with our physical limitations, I was nervous that a rural country bloke might not take kindly to our being together. Back in Sydney, being gay is hardly remarkable. But, in country, but if country folk in Oz were anything like what I'd encountered growing up in Kansas, I feared that prejudice in such a remote place had the potential to manifest into unwanted and hostile confrontation. For the few times that we were around other people, I tried to keep a low, lezzy profile, but once in a while, questions were asked. I'd initially avoided the outback pubs thinking they were dens of respite, reserved only for the most hearty of Aussie blokes. But after weeks of lukewarm Victoria bitters from a can, that's like Aussie Budweiser, my lips ached for a thirst-quenching, ice-cold draft beer. Yankee, lesbian or not, I wasn't about to let my nerves get between me and a pint. I'll never forget the first time we walked into a, into a dark shed of a remote pub. Before I had a chance to order my drink, the old dusty cobber leaning against the ancient wood bar looked us up and down from head to toe. Use two together? <laughs> he croaked from the top of his brew. You could tell by his tone, he wasn't asking if we were acquainted. He was asking if we were together. Yup, I said. His eyes narrowed, pinching back what seemed a retort of some kind. I needed a preemptive strike. I saw there was a small tube television airing the latest rugby league match between New South Wales and Queensland. We were in New South Wales at the time, so I let my patriotism fly. Go the Blues! 
What's the score? <laughs> That's right, old man. I know what's going on. With that, his head tilted to the side, as if to readjust the screws that kept his heterosexual brain safely in his skull. <laughs> Just, <laughs> poor guy, he doesn't even know the stories being written about him. <laughs> Just before my internal tensions reached their peak and forced me to withdraw, he busted out in a huge grin and asked, What'll you two Sheilas have? Without a beat, I'll have a schooner of old, thanks. Home, sweet Aussie home. Life is hard enough without knowing that you belong to someone, somewhere. Just a little bit of knowing that you're invited and welcome goes a long way to lifting the fog of loneliness. The rugged, sweltering, isolated interior of Australia managed to give me a glimpse of the difference between loneliness and solitude. There were some stretches of country where the only voice for days besides my partner's or my own was the squawk of a cockatoo. To break the silence with our words at times felt irreverent. Some days were so hot and the sun so searing that the only thing left for us to do was sit quietly, eyes closed in the shade of a paper bark tree and wait for the stars. In the beginning of our travels, so many thousands of kilometers ago, that silence drove me to tears. My mind would race with, with questions, with resentments and jealousies. Though Karen sat beside me through all of it, I wept from a place of gut-wrenching loneliness. Loneliness isn't as quiet as it sounds. For me, it was angry. I shook my fists. I cried. I shouted into every void for a return call of recognition, for acknowledgement. I accused. I judged. I cursed every soul and every little thought in my brain that said I was insignificant. I would have told you I was abandoned, rather than alone, ignored, cast out even. I wouldn't read Henry Nouwen's book, reaching out for a couple of years, but when I did, my memories went back to days recovering in the outback. I understood him when he talked about the differences between loneliness and solitude. The agony of loneliness has always been the emptiness I experience when I reach out and feel nothing there. In the desolate place where I'm forced to acknowledge my own weaknesses, Whenever I've been frightfully suspended in that ever-widening darkness, I twist and flail, screaming, I don't want to be alone. But solitude is different. It is much more quiet and restful. It's the place where, as now and suggested, I could claim my aloneness and still find peace. One day, under the cool, mottled shadows of the eucalyptus, I noticed those old tensions had fallen silent. I sat there, drunk in the in the ethereal space between wakefulness and dreaming, I kept my eyes shut and enjoyed the ceasefire. I felt warmth come over the top of my hand, like someone had gently placed their hand atop mine in a gesture of comfort. I smiled, let out a gentle, welcoming hum. I opened my eyes expecting to see Karen, but there was no one there, only the silhouette of gum leaves dancing across my skin. Maybe it was God, the wind, a patch of sunlight, or maybe just my imagination. I didn't know, and I didn't care. I was free from my usual compulsion to explain it. Beautiful and serene, it just was. With another satisfied hum, I rolled my head back in submission, closed my eyes, and accepted the stillness there. Um, yeah, so I don't know, at, at some point in time, that's just kind of the thing, it's, it, I love that kind of anecdote for me, even personally, because it, it starts in a place where I'm imagining the prejudices perceived toward me and the fears that I had of going to certain places and being myself at certain times, and then all of a sudden it lands, you know, in confronting them or dealing with them or finding, you know, that old Aussie bloke, I was all right. I wanted a beer and to watch the rugby, and that's all he needed. Whatever he might have understood or didn't understand about sexual orientation, we weren't there to have that conversation, and I wasn't there to have that conversation with him. I wanted a beer, and so did he, and you know, all of a sudden, by the end of it, just kind of letting go of those things and connecting in these really social ways um, that are normal 
and ordinary and almost boring until we sit back and realize how much they create a sense of peace in me. Those are the kinds of moments that really actually capture my imagination. The kinds of moments that I see not just there, but I see when I go to a pub and I see my audience dwindle in half because I come out and see the people that remain. Um, I'll share, I want to share one anecdote. One of my favorite stories is that, and like going back a little bit to all of the things that in, in my own conflict I thought I couldn't necessarily live with. You know, if I wasn't going to do Christian music, then I had to not play music anymore. If I didn't really know what I wanted to do about my sexual orientation and faith, I didn't think that I could be a person of faith anymore and all this kind of weird conflicts that I didn't quite resolve. Um, and somewhere along the way, getting back and doing music, I, I felt like I could play some of my old music, but very much none of it. <laughs> I mean, I maybe had one or two songs that I played, but when I went out and played in, in, in especially bars, I was really self-conscious about the types of faith-based music that I would tap into because I tapped into this idea that I, I, I didn't want anyone to think that I was there and singing about my own faith experience with an ulterior motive for them to feel like they had to be evangelized to. It's like, please stop thinking that about me. I don't, you don't have to like God. I don't, I'm not here for that. Like, let's just talk, man. Well, I had like a, a weird experience because in all of that obsession I had to just not be myself in these spaces and just forget about everything else. Um, I got invited to, I begged actually to go play in a lesbian bar in Philadelphia. I'd never been to a lesbi lesbian bar in my life. I was terrified. I had no idea what was going to happen. I just imagined like all kinds of like nipple piercings and leathers and I don't know, I, you know, and ladies in motorcycle boots, like I should talk. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I imagined. I even forgot my, my ring. I'd left it at home, and so I didn't want to go into a lesbian bar without my ring. So I was borrowing jewelry from people, like imagining like a swarm of hot lesbians would be all over me, and I'd have to beat them <laughs> off, whatever. Just sorted and just, you know, preposterous. I get in there, it's normal. You know, we're hanging out. Relatively, really boring. Like, a lot of just chicks sitting around drinking beer. Like, that was really hot. And... We're just hanging out. It was, it was packed. It was beautiful. It was hot. And I'm working really hard to just be cool. And these girls kept shouting out, you know, play Martyrs and Thieves. It's this old Christian song of mine that I, I would, that's been around forever. And I was like, no, thank you. And they kept shouting out like all these Christian songs, like really overt songs of faith. Some of the most overt, some of the most expressive. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. And at a certain point, I became really rude. Like, I was the one really rude. Like, somebody's asking me to share something with them that means a lot to them, right? The song's community. It's not mine anymore. I've shared it. It's escaped. I'm not its master. I'm it. <laughs> you know, somewhere in there. And all they want to do is hear the song, and all I keep saying is no until I start to realize, oh, I kind of don't look very good. So just for the sake of ego and not so much of anything noble, and to get them to shut up, because they'd been drinking a while. <laughs> I play the song, kind of begging that I would remember how to play it. It's six minutes long. It's epic. It never ends. <laughs> and about three minutes into it, I started to surrender to the experience a little bit, but mostly because the entire room had begun to sing the song. Like, it was weird. It was like a praise and worship ses session in a downtown Philadelphia lesbian bar. And everything that I'd ever been taught about that experience or what that experience was supposed to look like, it looked like nothing like that. It wasn't debauched. It wasn't angry or, you know, a drunken, sexual, lesbian extravaganza. They were normal people hanging out in a social setting. And more than that, they brought their faith with them. They brought their experience with the art with them. Whatever that story was with the music and why whatever they had connected with that, they didn't throw that baby out with the bathwater in their experience. Instead, they went back to it. And it taught me such an amazing lesson in that moment. I'd under, like, I underrated my art. I underrated, you know, kind of going back to the first excerpt that I wrote, that I shared with you, I underrated any ability that I had unless I came with some drastic ulterior motive that I'd 
had been beaten into my brain as a Christian music artist. You've got to get people to believe what you want. You've got to get people to, to be on board and agree with you and show up and you have to convince them of what it is that you want them to believe because what you believe is the right thing. Instead, what they got, you know, they just kind of dropped all that and got me to just sit in the moment and realize that, that any gift that we contribute, we cannot, you know, one, we can have that individual experience, but we don't always get to define what that is for other people. And if, if you sit back every once in a while and just get out of the way of it as well, it has an opportunity to let other people show you what that experience means for them. And, and for me, that's the real joy. So when we start to talk about how art becomes a conversation of any of the social justice issues that we have. I mean, I know it's that weird ro road of art, right? We, we think we're so awesome and smart when we do it in, in or playing with the gods like Picasso, right? That I get to change the world with my art. But just by doing it and putting something innocent and humble of your own experience, it's genuine and honest. And, and making that door as wide as possible for other people to show up and come in with with that strange paradox of the, the whatever ulterior motive that you may have with what create, creative thing that you're putting in that space, but also with enough neutrality, with enough compassion to understand that there is a space that if you give someone the opportunity to come into that, you might find something amazing and truly extraordinary and unexpected, but just simply having said yes. For me, that story goes back to some really amazing things, by right? saying yes to just picking up my guitars again, just playing a song in private, to playing it in public, or to going to a lesbian bar and doing something a little bit uncomfortable to me and finding out that yes, what we do and we, what we contribute matter, can, what we contribute desperately matters to that, um, and that there's a real to me it was a real kind of uh, reaffirming of the idea that if I hang out here long enough. In, in an idea and an attitude of invitation for anybody to come, the better, the, the more exciting that'll be. On that same night, by the way, a straight white couple came in. They introduced themselves as fiscal Republicans to me before they ever said their names. <laughs> they were kind of weird and like, we're in a lesbian bar, what do I do? It's sort of like when lesbians go to churches. It's like, what do I do? Not always, not some of you in here, but sometimes. But they were like, that's what they wanted to introduce. We're conservative Christian we're fiscal Republicans, and we're in a lesbian bar. And I'm like, well, yes, you are, and thanks for coming. But it turned out to be, like, it was an engaging experience and for them, too, you know? Like, they, they went in being self-conscious about whatever road had led them to that, that art, that moment, that signal in time that got put out there. They followed that, and they were drawn to that and that was an experience for them. They weren't looking to have an LGBT conversation, but they weren't afraid of having one either because they were still connecting to the art. So, you know, I could ramble on about all this stuff a lot more. I think I'll just play one more song. Um, probably the only politically charged song I have in my entire arsenal, and it's still incredibly subtle. You have to dig <laughs> really hard to get it. But. Um, when I came back to the United States, I'd been out of the country effectively about eight years. And the political climate and the way that we talked to one another, in my experience, had radically changed. Um, and I came back in, oh, I think, oh, seven or oh, eight, I did my first trip, was having a bit of culture shock, and then I moved back in oh, nine, and I flew into LA and California, and it was all during the Prop 8 stuff, uh, Proposition 8 conversation in, in California. And I was watching from afar in Australia how you know some faith leaders and like the entire country was sending money to fight this battle from all you know all walks of life were getting into this look what I always imagined was a state and local conversation was becoming this national conversation and I noticed that and I was watching some of the commercials and seeing some of the rhetoric and was completely freaked out knowing that I was going to be part of that conversation um, when I moved back but I also was trying to figure out, you know, how my faith was going to play into that. I knew that people were going to talk about it. And just in my own private talk to myself and my own private experience, I was weighing that, that political idea and re weighing these religious thoughts and trying to figure out how these two would coexist. So um, this song's a little bit about that kind of experience, but at the same time, in talking about that we're, I'm just doing a little artistic examination here. In trying to talk about the motivation of that neutrality, I want people to be able to, to find the social activism in it that's familiar to them with the language and strains and maybe one or two really 
finely placed words, but I also want the people who know and listen to what I say from a, a faith-based community to know, find those strategically placed and well to, you know, beautiful, shiny little things that they want to follow. And I want really, at the end of that, for people to kind of find themselves at the center of that, look up and find themselves there, so. That'll be better. I need a roadie. What as a sheet you can bleed to dry? Should we take and never ask why? Huddled in masses, we sit on our asses and hold. What good is the giving of a life for a life? You say it's trouble enough to fight, but I won't lay down and die. Oh, you can bury what's left of me under mercy's tree. I got it. Give and bury what's left of me. Oh, I've had a total brain fart. I got it now. Can I start again? Edit that. There's a little red light on. I see it. You can bury what's left of me under mercy's tree. That's a sign you're getting old. We tread truth for a banner, a slogan or two. Underneath it, we all look insane. It's a broken umbrella in a gathering storm Soon enough we will all wash away And I will not be waiting For the season to change You say it's trouble enough to fight But I All of my formal shenanigans. I don't know if you want to talk to me or not, but, or I'm happy to go. Yeah. You look like you're going to say something. Oh, well, I'm trying to think of, of a question for you. Oh. I, I, I have the question. So what would you say to, um, to a young person? Um, what would you say to a young person who finally gets the courage to come out? and experiences much of the same things that you did. In, I mean, in, in retrospect, what would, you, what would you say to someone in the 18 to 20? Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing I always try and say is you've got to have this sa a safe environment to do that. I, mean, I, I feel like there's sometimes this huge pressure on LGBT people on this great prize of coming out that kind of pressures people into feeling like, well, you're kind of letting the LGBT community come down. 
or you know, they're let, you're letting the LGBT community come down, come, letting them down if you're not coming out. Um, and I, I think that's the first thing that I always kind of tell people is you, you don't owe anybody anything, but you owe it to your story to follow that path and that journey as best as you possibly can. Now with that being said, most people know <laughs> it's an odd intrinsic thing about knowing the difference between when you're not telling someone something about you. I mean, it's, it's a cap, it's a lid, it's a barrier to, you know, that's trying to keep you from moving on in your life. So knowing that those things are coming, I don't know what else to say going, yeah, gird your loins. It's going to happen. Find a safe environment, find some safe friends, but get education. I talk about that a lot. Um, you know, read up on, you know, connect with other people, read a book. You know, go connect with other people who are talking about this. The internet's a fantastic thing. You can do it quiet now, which is fantastic. Christians buy my book all the time and they don't have to be seen in public with it. It's great. Um, that's a joke now on the e-books and the internet. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, education, being prepared for that day, but to not be so frightened of it that it makes you hesitate. I mean, that's, we're often afraid of doing difficult things, right? That we don't do them because we're procrastinating doing them, but at what expense to your own life and your own story and your own mental health to be able to do that. But also in the same way you have to balance that and get your mental health right to be able to confront those things. I mean, I was, you know, in, t in terms of public, in terms of the public, I was quote unquote in the closet for close to eight or nine years probably in my own experience by, um, and you know, I wasn't in the closet. Like everybody in my life knew there was no secret. I'm walking the street, I'm very gay. But from, from like a professional level, I hadn't had the press release out yet. It took me nine, eight, nine years to get there. I wouldn't play music. I was terrified of playing music because I knew that this was a conversation I was going to have and I just knew I wasn't ready for it. And it took a long time for me to be ready for it. You know, I don't know. I really don't have that perfect answer for what made me ready for it, except for I obsessed about it for nine years. I thought about it every day. I interviewed myself while I'm walking down the street and talking to imaginary people. Um, I'm answering, you know, imaginary internet trolls, all of that, just kind of rehearsing my own confidence and my own story and to know my own story and that and to know that this was just the next and right thing to do and that I was ready. Like, I just knew that that was coming. I was prepared for it. I wasn't surprised by it. So in the end, it actually turned out for me, I describe it as relatively boring. It was hard as hell and it took a lot of energy out of me. but. It was really surprisingly boring. The, the best part of my coming out, I usually tell people, is the absolute and utter surprise I had about the good things that happen. The support, the amount of people that come up to you and start saying, dude, I'm here for you. You don't have that when you don't share your story. So get educated too. Yeah. That's cool. All right. That's fine. Yes, sir. Um, one, just a, something that you said a minute ago made me think of this. Um, I'm a pastor at a church in Murfreesboro. Hey, pastor. And, um, and one of the members of my congregation um, suggested that I read Fifty Shades of Grey, mm -hmm. but they probably wouldn't be caught with your book. And I just think that's such a strange thing. <laughs> <laughs> I need a minute for that. I got to like process that. Keep well, that. You're the one who said, you know, somebody in a church could be could be reading your book because it's an e-book. Yeah. Not be, right. Yep. So that's that's kind of what I'm saying. You know, we've got this Fifty Shades of Grey and this big controversy about violence and and <laughs> yet something that's life-giving and sustaining like what you've written is something right. that somebody would avoid. Um, but I I wanted to um, just briefly say. Um, that I, I have, uh, I, I have a lot of gratitude to you because it was partially uh, something that you've done, you created. That is the reason I'm in the ministry. Um, I'm I'm a musician, and uh, what kind of drew me into the ministry was was music, and I wrote and recorded. And, um, but yeah, I got suckered in that way too. Yeah, <laughs> it was because of because of the the earlier stuff that you're talking about that um, 
that you had tried to set aside for a while, and and uh, I guess I I'm not sure where I'm going with this except to say that you know all that music that you performed at that time is still life affirming to me, and um, and it was never in to me. It, I mean. The orientation issue was never a part of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I realize that it will never be that way for you in your life because people make it about that now. That's, but that's you terrible. know, that's not necessarily true, actually. And it kind of one of the, if I may, um, in taking what you're saying is that what, like one of the instant arguments and a little bit of like the, the in between the lines of what you're saying is some people have experienced in particular like oh I can't listen to that artist anymore because they represent some something or some ideology that I just don't like instead of just being moved by the things that you are connected we judge them and throw them out um, and I did that the same way with my own work as well um, I thought oh my gosh you know that's right. I, I was on board with everybody else who said the same thing. This stuff's rubbish. You can't use it. It has no value. It must have not had any potency or, you know, I don't know how you go back and erase what's been done. But um, that was kind of the argument. And it wasn't until I started, like, actually hanging out with people. And I, I was writing all that stuff off, going, yeah, my, my faith experience must not have been important because now everybody says that my faith experience and everything I contributed to it and the things that I talked about had no value and no meaning. Like, let's assume I walked out on the other end of it and I decided to be an atheist. I still think that art has value. It's about the place and the time and the spiritual experience it was possible, and for the people that connect to it and however they connect to it, which I don't get to decide, um, is an amazing thing. And so for me to be able to even just open that door, um, and for me the lure, like you were talking about music, music for me was the lure of, it always talks me into doing things that are so outside my comfort zone. It, you know, it, it says, oh, man, you've got to talk about this and express this, and then I do, but it asked me to be vulnerable. It asked me to share things in public that, I mean, you don't have to be crass, but it's really hard to talk about the things that I love or, you know, read an excerpt from my book and cry embarrassingly in public. I hate that, but it makes you want to share that story, and, and for can, connecting to you and, and hearing stories like that for me was regenerative is what I'm trying to get at. To be able to go out there and share it, and we go from, like, an, in an artistic sense, from this individualized, personal, selfish experience, we go out and share it, it becomes a community experience, and in a weird way, it cycles back around, and we just kind of, you know, it's very eco-friendly. We keep kind of regenerating the spirit, as long as we don't, we are the ones in the agency and at that point in time letting it reciprocate. So that part of it and you being able to reciprocate that back to me and letting me know and hear that is even half the reason why I'm still doing this today. I mean, the last four years for me have not been easy. The first couple of years after coming out, I really, it, it could have been done. But for something about that, like going to lesbian bars, meeting pastors, you know, not in lesbian bars, but sometimes. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's that cycle of, you know, just trusting in these kind of mechanisms that keep showing up that offer us that experience, and music does that. Um, obviously, that's been my experience, but art does that, and well, we continue to give to it. It gives back to us. You, you dive into it, and you let it go, and you give it away, and it, it creates this amazing sense of contribution. And I don't know how the Fifty Shades of Grey thing is going to work out. Um, maybe there's a pastoral message in there that if you do, send me an email link to your sermon. That'll be fantastic. I've not read the book. I don't need to. My life is exciting enough. But <laughs> that being said, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to disparage anybody's art. I don't, I do, Kanye West. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't want to disparage any of that because somewhere, 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 somehow, some way that connects to somebody and someday, sometime, that one artist or that one song or that one painting or that mo one moment may speak to me and it, I don't want to be in the place of judging the people or limiting that access and I think if anything, like stories like yours are the one that remind me to kind of keep pressing and challenging all the fear stuff that kind of keeps us from that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm rambling too much, but thank you. I really dig it. It means a lot to me. It's embarrassing to have to say thank you. But I mean it. Like, it's, it is the air that has been in my lungs on, on days that I kind of wonder what's the point. You know, because I totally... It, the, it's the part of it, I think, sometimes when creatives do creative stuff that we think that the point sometimes for artists to create is so you will notice them. 
you know, you will support their careers, you will get their autograph, you will take a photo with them, whatever. And it's the, the people that I've always respected are just people who are creating whether or not you're watching at all. You know, we're not always extroverts. Sometimes we're extremely introverted and that all that art we do in an introverted place does that, but it expresses something so deeply personal that I think sometimes in the media, frenzied world and celebrity world, we eat, eat, eat all that stuff up. We forget to realize that there's this really beautiful process that can happen and all that. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the end. You guys got to move on, right? Well, thank, thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you a little bit later. I'm sure chatting on the thingy. All right, cool. Thanks.